Hi guys, and in today's watch video, we've got a Seiko week data um, with the separate day date windows. A lovely old Seiko, and I do really, really like these separate date windows. Very, very similar in design to the Citizen Auto data um, that I uh, have a couple of, and. You can tell also with the case back, you can see it's marked waterproof. And the model number is a 6218-8010. So, let's get this opened up. I've already loosened off the case back, as you can see. And inside we've got a nice, very nice clean looking movement. Bal balance is uh, swinging a little bit there, which uh, is always good to see. And the oscillating weight is swinging freely as well. Evidence of brassing on the edge of the bridges, which is not at all uncommon with vintage Seiko and is typically down to a worn bearing here. That one doesn't actually look too bad but there is somewhere there's a, a little bit of wiggle there as you can see but I've certainly seen worse and as I say that's evidenced by the little bits of brassing around the edges of the bridges down here and we have here the tiniest tiniest crown I've ever seen on uh, on any watch um, and Seiko's uh, a lot of the Seiko 5s have very small crowns uh, you'll note also it has a hacking function as well you pull the crown out and it hacks and stops the seconds and obviously there's uh, wasn't a great deal of power wound into that but you can see it's swinging just there pull the crown out and it stops push it back in and it will swing again. Oh, just inside the case back as well, just uh, for interest, we have this little sticker with the marker on which says 601226 2012 perhaps not sure not sure what that is but a service mark of some kind and just going to lift away the oscillating weight and I'll just give that a little bit of a wind so it does run, as you can see. It's um, a little bit lethargic, but it's running. Let's remove the case clamp screws. Along with the case clamps. To get this gasket out because I don't want to smear silicone grease all over everything and there does appear to be a bit of silicone grease that's actually not in too bad a condition um, it's a little bit stiff it's not it's not ideal but it's uh, I've certainly seen worse ones and uh, many worse ones on Seiko that just crumble the instant you take them out of the case okay. There's the movement. You can see the chapter ring remains in the case. Well, we'll disassemble the case for cleaning. You can see here a little tab. This locates into a slot. This is a common um, common design element on uh, on Seiko's with an internal bezel, and this prevents it rotating when the movement is in place. You can see there's a little slot here that that locates into. You can see here a little tab. This locates into a slot. This is a common um, 
common design element on uh, on Seiko's with an internal bezel and this prevents it rotating when the movement is in place. You can see there's a little slot here that that locates into. You can see here a little tab. This locates into a slot. This is a common um, common design element on, uh, on Seiko's with an internal bezel and this prevents it rotating when the movement is in place. You can see there's a little slot here that that locates into. We'll get the hands aligned and remove them and then we can remove the dial. Aston is a little bit reluctant to go in so when they're like this I like to, well maintaining a bit of pressure just press the stem release button so the bag over there to protect the dial while well, we slip the hand levers underneath and tease off the hands Loosen those a little more. And I'm just using one of my hand levers to just gently pry up under the dial like so and underneath the dial we've got an interesting little spacer ring you can see it has two tabs here and here which correspond to these cutouts here and here where the dial feet is uh, dial foot is up here and likewise over here so that will obviously only fit back on in one correct orientation which is good so pop those safely aside with the hands the hour washer or the dial washer rather and then the day wheel which simply lifts away like so you can see here already that the dual count has clearly been artificially increased by use of these cap jewels. These might even be, I think these are, these are actually blind jewels, um, as in essentially additional fake, um, unnecessary jewels as it were. These these don't look to actually serve any purpose other than to increase the jewel count. I'll find a movement holder, get some finger cuts and we will start the disassembly proper. And what I'm going to do first of all is remove the balance and the automatic works uh, before I start on the keyless works which is something I typically do with any automatic watch. Get the automatic works out of the way first. The auto winding bridge is held with three screws. This will be further stripped down later by removing these two plates that retain the pole levers and the reduction wheel. Check for any residual power in the mainspring. Um, I'm assuming there is none currently, but just always like to check to be sure. 
Well, very, very tiny amount, but uh, nothing really to speak of. So a bit of an Achilles heel on most Seiko, apart from uh, some of the later jeweled ones, is wear on the barrel arbors. And this one looks like it does have some wear on the barrel arbors. I don't know how clearly this will be coming across on here, but hopefully you can see that there. For the sake of safety, we remove the delicate parts, that being the balance wheel. And what I'm going to do just here is lifting the balance cock and using an oiler is just tease the pivot out of its hole like so. Which will allow me to lift away the balance. I can then Flip that over and lay it on its back like so. I'm not a fan of using balance tacks. I know they're fine in my head. Um, it's They're used by hundreds and hundreds of people. They are used without problem, but seeing the balance hanging there bothers me. It's, it's not something I'm a fan of doing. So my preferred method for storage is to remove the balance and flip it over upside down like so. I will use a balance tack if I have to adjust a collet on the balance, for example. Day wheel jump spring, which is retained by a single screw, which is shouldered. Hopefully you can see that. This should then just lift clear of the pivot, I am assuming. Okay, it does indeed lift clear, but the pivot is built into the jump spring itself. If I can lift that off and show you, it's just dropped back in. Typical, when you want them to do that, they won't. Come on now. There we go. And right at this point, I'm just going to remove the hour wheel and get that out of the way. I'm assuming that also the intermediate driving wheel for the calendar will lift off and it does, yeah. We need to remove these cover plates. Both of these are held by two tiny countersunk screws. Looking at the design of this, this is obviously designed in such a manner that this little shepherd's crook spring slides into this slot after this wheel is fitted and doesn't have to be fitted before. And we have another shepherd's crook spring just down here for the day wheel jumper. Uh, sorry, for the calendar wheel jumper. And that one's not bad. It's got a nice deep recess for it to sit into when it's refitted. And the calendar wheel jump spring slides off of its post here. Similarly, two very tiny countersunk screws, one of which did not want to leave the screwdriver. single individual cover plate for the minute wheel and of course at this point the calendar wheel can be removed. I'm going to remove the cover plate for the minute wheel single screw and a small plate which simply lifts away followed by the minute wheel and then the cannon pinion. So we'll try with the Presto tool first of all and see if this lifts it away. And it does very nicely indeed. And then we'll remove 
of the calendar works. The lovely, lovely all metal calendar works. This is what we like to see. So we have a large shouldered screw. We have the finger which operates the date um, the day wheel driver and some sticky oil that's why that didn't want to separate that's actually quite sticky with oil and then underneath here we have got um, quite a unique driving star with a pin uh, driven into it so let's try and get that up here so we can actually see that First thing to be removed is the ratchet wheel. Which is a dished ratchet wheel as you can see there. The click can follow that. And the design of the click and click spring is a combined one common to many many Seiko models and if you've stripped a few Seiko models you will recognize the design of that while we have everything kind of visible I'm going to have another check of the barrel there I don't know, again, it's uh, doing this in such a way that it's visible to you is quite tricky. But if you screw in a piece of pegwood there, you can you can actually give that a little bit of a wiggle and, a, and check for, um, for end play by moving it up and down. While I have access, I'm just going to go ahead and check the end play. of the fourth wheel there you can see the hack Got the hacking mechanism just here and I'm also going to check the third wheel that seems okay and the escape wheel after I've removed the pallets what's nice to see with this is if it weren't for, for the sticker inside the case back, it would be hard to tell that this has actually had work done in the past. And that's that's a good thing um, because, because I work on vintage watches quite a bit. I see so many with badly scarred screw heads and scratches right across the plates where screwdrivers have slipped and the like. And while none of these things will actually affect the operation generally speaking they are of course ugly they're not pretty to see so it's nice to see a watch that has been worked on previously which is not all scarred we can go ahead and remove the train and barrel bridge combined it's held by three screws nice and clean looks good I'm going to pop the whoops I'm going to pop the fourth wheel the center seconds out the main spring barrel and get that out of the way very similar to a 6139 barrel I will pop the spring out of that in a moment and here you can see the hack and rather than it working on the balance as is common for hacking mechanisms. 
This one's obviously designed in such a way that it just bears on, what does that bear on? Onto the fourth wheel, there we go, yeah. So you pull that out to the setting position and you can see that actually springs in and bears onto the fourth wheel or the center seconds wheel and stops it. Hmm. Nice, uh, nice and simple, but uh, but clever and certainly does the job. So I'm going to go ahead and remove this. And is that a shouldered screw? It's not actually a shouldered screw. Um, but but ah, yes, I see it's actually got the shouldered edge on the plate here. So this obviously should just now lift clear. You've got one tang which fits into your clutch and then the other one the other finger which bears onto the wheel and stops the movement we can now move or remove rather the third wheel and the escape wheel if I can wiggle that free Trying to do that on the uh, so you can see on the camera. There we go. I'm going to pop the plate off and then decide whether I need to remove that for cleaning. I don't know. I don't know if that will be particularly necessary. We shall find that out shortly. So a single screw holds the second wheel bridge. That pops off and flips over like so. Oh, I see. Yes, I will need to remove that because um, what we've got here is a jewel for the second wheel, which is nice. And then this plate above it is actually a jewel for the fourth wheel. So it's um, it's it's a jewel for where the center seconds passes through. So I will remove that, and uh, that's something. Well, uh, not so much the jewel, but the screw. Very, very tiny. So clearly that's something I will have to be very careful with. Um, what size driver are we? Let's have a look. I thought that might have been my very smallest one, but not quite. Not quite. And lift that clear. And then this little fellow should just, is that still on the screen? That's still on the screen. This little fellow should just lift clear like so. So yes, you can see there, you've got the jewel in this piece and you've got the jewel for the second wheel down there as well. And then the second wheel quite simply lifts clear like so. So they will all be inspected and the vast majority of this will be go through a hand cleaning process before it goes through the cleaning machine as I typically do. So that's the movement side completely stripped with the exception of course of the uh, Diafix jewels and the mainspring barrel. Mainspring barrel is, uh, let's pop that aside a moment. So the mainspring barrel is exactly like the 6139 in construction. Oh, let's get this in focus for you, apologies. And yes, as you can see, this is caked with Seiko's beautiful um, molly type grease I'm sure they they must have back in the in the 60s sometime they, they must have just uh, gotten um, an entire shipment of 25 gallon drums of molly grease I think and then they just relabeled it Seiko S2 is it or whichever one it is and they just use it on everything so there's the barrel arbor and I will I mean, you'll see in just a moment after I've unwound this spring how incredibly, incredibly dirty this stuff is. Apologies for the off-screen stuff here, but essentially what I'm doing here is just using 
thumbs alternately to unwind oops to unwind this and there's the mainspring barrel and here after I've after I've given this a wipe just to show you how incredibly filthy this grease is you can now see these cots that were pristine and clean just a moment ago are absolutely caked as are my finger and thumb very nice uh, the spring itself is not in her in an horrendously bad shape but as I say it will be replaced we'll pop the barrel stuff aside that will get a good manual cleaning first before it goes in the cleaning machine uh, very important with Seiko barrels very important with any barrels that have been greased but very important with Seiko barrels because of this absolute um, mess of grease that's in there you do not want that contaminating your cleaning fluid so bear that in mind so you can see down here this is the train and barrel bridge and these are the diafix springs now what a lot of people try to do with these that makes it much more difficult is actually remove them completely and that's absolutely not what you want to do unless they are damaged what you want to do is try and keep them in place so what i try to do is i usually use a finger but that's going to end up obscuring things so i'm going to use a bit of pegwood and just get this in place and then i will get out of the way or get my head out of the way rather so you can see so what i usually do is use my finger over the two legs at the bottom like so it's going to be very very tricky because the camera looks almost straight down at my bench and trying to get this on screen for you guys is going to be incredibly tricky there is a little bit of lag so i can't even use the monitor and then using a thin oiler you pop that into the single leg like so hopefully you saw that and my head wasn't in the way at that moment and then you slide this up like so and the final part of the disassembly is the keyless works so we have one screw here which is a long shouldered screw this holds this cover plate which does two jobs it retains the setting lever spring here and the quick date change star here the date change star sits on a um, a pivot which is part of the yoke and a pivot down here and both of these are slotted to allow the date change star to slide the setting lever spring we can just lift off i'm trying to do this so each part comes away individually so you can see setting lever spring lifts away the quick date change star likewise lifts away and you can see a little bit more clearly now the slotted piece and the pivot there and there this just lifts away and apologies um I should have said there the driving star this this is riveted together that's the driving star that's driven by the clutch the teeth on the clutch to change the date you then have the setting lever with actually a, se a separate sort of retaining spring and then a shepherd's crook spring and the yoke so we can remove the shepherd's crook spring oops like so quite an unusual shaped one that one we can lift away the yoke and there you can see a little bit more clearly the pivot and then we need to remove this screw just here this retaining spring which is forked at the tip to go around 
the little pivot, the setting lever, like so. And I don't know if you noticed there, but the setting lever um, release button just dropped through there. So at this point here, if I grab a hold of the clutch, remove the stem, I can remove the clutch there. And just having a, a look up close, um, it's probably clearer on the video than it is to me uh, looking at it from several inches away with the naked eye. I've just had a look through the loop and that does in fact have a little slot milled into it, which clearly is designed to engage with this fork right here. But that's the complete strip down of this movement. Uh, the next step, as I say, will be some manual cleaning, removal of the diafix, all of the rest of the diafix jewels, the cap jewels for and chat on for the balance, refit the balance once that's manually cleaned, and then this will all go through the cleaning machine. And it will then be a case of ordering some parts for the rebuild which is just looking like we're going to need a mainspring and uh, hopefully that should be about it.